good evening everybody i welcome all of you to the 24th lecture of uh, the webinar series of archaeological sciences center iit gandhinagar so uh, today we are completing two years of our journey we have uh, conducted lectures on different topics starting from the prehistoric archaeology and then venturing into proto history uh, then harappan archaeology and today uh, we are having professor suraj pandit he is from uh, Uh, Satya College, Mumbai, and he is an he is an expert uh, on West Western Indian rock cut architecture, iconography, Buddhism, and as I we have been discussing, uh, he is also into this Jain iconography and art and architecture. So he is a vers versatile scholar who has been working on this aspect uh, ever since his MA days. I mean, looking into his uh, expertise, I have observed that he has his vast expert experience on this. Uh, uh rocket architecture and also various aspects related to buddhism of western india in in uh, a particular and uh, ge generally and from other regions also so his uh, his phd is also on uh, incidentally is on um, kaneri caves uh, uh, which is the ancient uh, krishnagiri on which he is going to uh, deliberate so he is also a, a prolific pub, uh, publisher he has published uh, nine books and uh, several research articles on various aspects of uh, art architecture and iconography uh, i i welcome uh, uh, professor suraj pandit uh, for this lecture series and i am really thankful to you for sparing your valuable time to deliver this lecture and i also welcome all the participants uh, uh, for this uh, lecture and now i i request uh, professor suraj to deliver the thank you sir for these nice words i firstly thank dr prabhakar for inviting me and gandhi nagar iit for giving me this opportunity for sharing my thoughts madam uh, sharda if you allow me can i share my screen yes please yes please So today I'm going to talk about Kushnagiri Mahavihar, uh, the study of its patronage during early historic period. I'm sorry, there is some issue. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about Kushnagiri Mahavihar, that is Kaneri, uh, the, the the modern site of Kaneri, which is within the city limits of mumbai i think this is one of the largest rocket monastic site uh, in india which has around 129 caves gathered at one particular place when we look at the development or origin of this site uh, there is no concrete evidence coming from the epigraphical sources or literary sources but what archaeological sources from sopara and literary sources the stray references coming from sinhali literature and the later uh, descriptions coming from yansen's account it indicates uh, that probably kaneri has its origin or its roots in the monastic settlement at sopara which uh, started somewhere in the mauryan period it is interesting to see that this monastery at sopara Uh, is uh, widely referred to in uh, literary uh, sources in early buddhist literature so basically pali canonical literature and there are couple of uh, you can say uh, nikayas that is the sects in buddhism early buddhism buddhism which were popular at this particular place one of them was dharmotariya other was sarvastivadi third was mahasangika Uh, so these were very popular as we know from the epigraphical uh, literary sources from the early period so gradually this entire uh, uh, group of monks uh, gathered at sopara uh, gradually started moving towards south and at one point of time they probably identified this particular site called kanheri or krishna giri which literally means black mountain so uh, this is the protected side of kaneri i think my cursor is visible uh, is my cursor visible yes yes it is visible 
So this is the protective side of Kaneri, which comprises around 101 caves uh, on, uh, on these two uh, small hillocks, you can say. So this is uh, Southern Hill and this is Northern Hill. And then there is uh, one Eastern Hill, which is uh, relatively higher than uh, these two uh, hills, which has evidence of early caves coming to us. And that is basically what I call it as formative phase at Kaneri, uh, which is uh, which is uh, can be seen uh, in this region rather than this. One of the characteristic features of these early caves is most of them, like rather all of them, they are settled on the uh, in the vicinity of uh, some waterfalls or, or some water sources, which were uh, primarily active during the rainy season. So uh, these water sources were the main uh, source for drinking water, or fresh water, we can say, for people living in this area. So this suggests that the early caves were actually used as Varshavas or Vassavasa during the rainy season where monks used to stay there. And like there are two types of monasteries which we uh, know about. One is the village monastery and other is forest monastery. So forest monasteries are usually used by the monks who are living in village monasteries to isolate, to meditate upon, you know, so they used to uh, go uh, uh, to the forest monastery for, uh, for a particular period in a year to isolate themselves, to meditate upon something like some object or something like that. And they have minimum contact with the outside world. So probably the beginning of Kaneri, what we see here is uh, uh, probably uh, from that forest monastery type and uh, only during the Varshava, so the rainy season months used to stay here. When we look at, I'm sorry, when we look at this entire site of Kaneri, this is the view taken from the, the, the early site of the protected monument. You know, so this, this narrates us the entire history of, you can say, uh, 6.5 million years, because this talks about the geological formation, this talks about the flora and fauna and the modern, modern city of Mumbai, uh, just uh, beyond that. So, uh, this gives us uh, some understanding how these early monks must have stayed over here. So in this isolated forest land, uh, this small hillock has been virtually combed uh, for caves and like uh, they, 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 they just created places for their residence. So all these early caves which you see, so this is one of the classic examples, this is cave number 25. Though this is not an early cave, but this, this follows the same model of the early caves where you have natural ca caverns kind of thing, a depression or a hole kind of thing in a, in a hill. And then that is gradually developed into a place where monk can sit, meditate or stay. You know, so natural caves being modified is the early feature and that, that also can be seen in this case. Now this is the, the hill of like the, the site of Kaneri. Uh, thanks to thanks to Sanjay Gandhi National Park, they allowed us to take this like do this do drone photography during you know lockdown period. So thanks a lot for, for that is their photo courtesy I'm, I'm mentioning here. So this is the northern hill, this is the southern hill, and this is the eastern hill. So as all early caves are located here, around seventy five percent of the caves. Uh, which are known to us, they, will, they, they are excavated on this particular hillock and then the uh, rest of the 25% uh, they are located on, on this hill. So uh, this is a general landscape of Sanjay Gandhi National Park and this entire area is known as Krishnagiri Upavan. So there was a small uh, uh, tribal hamlet just behind Kaneri near this lake. But the, the, the lake which you see here is a Tulsi lake which was one of the major source for water in the, 18, uh, in the 19th century Mumbai. So Britishers expanded that entire lake and uh, like there are three lakes which in, in, in a series to see Vihar and Pawai Lake uh, on the bank of which we have IIT Pawai. 
And also, uh, these three were the major source of water for Mumbai. And uh, we know the antiquity of this Tulsi Lake at least goes back to Satavana period because there are certain coins which we have found on the banks of Tulsi Lake of the early period in, in our survey, our explorations. So when we look at uh, this landscape, we realize that how difficult it must be to reach here uh, for the early months. And then uh, there are very really stray water sources which made them very uh, not comfortable to stay at one place other than um, the rainy season. But gradually, when we look at uh, the developments at Taneri uh, in the second century AD, what we see is they have developed uh, rainwater harvesting system and water management plan uh, at Kaneri, which uh, enabled them to settle in, in this particular uh, landscape. Now, uh, this is the actual entrance of the site, and this is tier number one, one, two, and three, uh, what we observe here. So, uh, this cave number two is supposed to be the earliest known cave from this particular hillock and supposed to be earliest from the mature phase of Kaneri. So we will we'll talk about the chronology of uh, like the, the development of chronology of the site. But uh, I, I divide the entire development in three phases, the formative phase, the mature phase, and the phase of the decline. You know, So the formative phase is the early phase where it was used as Vashavasa, uh, for like as a forest monastery, the mature phase where we actually see the usage of landscape has changed, the perception of landscape has changed, and they have started using it as a as a permanent settlement, and they have used it for next around 13, 1400 years. So the span which we see at Kaneri of the activities that is from first century BC to 15th century AD. Again. Uh, this is one of the exceptional site, Buddhist site, monastic sites, which continued till 15th century AD. Because most of the sites on the periphery, as well as in the North India and the South India, they, they, they vanished, disappeared, declined, came to an end, but Kaneri continued. Probably it is so because it was on an island. This island was surrounded by various port sites where various traders were appearing. So the port, port sites like Sopara, Kalyan, Chaul, Elephanta, they were responsible for bringing these traders in. Rather, these traders were responsible for the rise of these uh, different commercial port sites, which actually was a catchment for Kaneri. These traders who had no names, who had no identity, who are being reflected in just as a human figure in art at Kaneri, were actually the patrons. They were the people who have created Kaneri. You can imagine excavating around uh, 75 to 80 caves within 200, uh, 200 or, uh, odd years. It needs a lot of money. And these were the people who have no specific names otherwise, no specific identity otherwise, or collectively known as patrons to us. They have created Kaneri. And we know Kaneri because of that. So there were three categories of, uh, you can say, patrons, which, which we see. The first category was of the donors who have renounced the world where we have Acharyas, Bhadantas, Theras, Pavajitas, and Bhikkhunis. So these are the different categories of monks which we see who have their own hierarchy within the monastic settlement. Now the question arises from where have they gathered the money to donate? And also there are various uh, theories and hypotheses and suggestions coming from scholars about from where would they get the money? The obvious answer, many scholars uh, seek in was uh, probably at the time of renunciation of the world, uh, whatever property property they had, they had given in the donation and got them an embryo, which is difficult to believe because uh, sometimes you see Acharya giving donations, you know. So uh, for becoming an Acharya, you need to, you need to have a, you know, let yourself through a proper spiritual journey 
in, in, in a religious structure. So, so if, if you renounce the world today and maybe after 15 years you become Acharya and then you donate your property is not possible because you have already renounced the world and at the time of renunciation you have already uh, like given your property out. You know, so, so from where the money was coming to these people? Uh, what I suggest in this case is what, what we see around, like even today in the Jain living traditions or even in Buddhist living traditions, many times what happens is the lady is giving donation on the name of Acharya. So probably this was the case to gain the spiritual merit. Uh, lady was given donation in the names of various Acharyas and that was recorded on the name of these Acharyas in the books. You know, so uh, probably like you can say Pravarjita is probably newly initiated one. Uh, who can uh, have this kind of donations like at the time of uh, accepting Pravarjita, uh, like uh, Pabajja or Pravarja, uh, they can donate whatever they have. But in case of Acharyas or Bhadantas, it is not possible. And they have a specific role in the monastic hierarchy to play. So this is the first category who are giving donations. There is an interesting observation which we see in case of the donations coming from these uh, Acharyas and they, uh, they mainly share the spiritual merit of these uh, donations, not only with their kids and kids only, but many times the expression see, like we see an inscription as reflected saying, let the all living beings become, uh, beings become Buddha one day. You know, so whatever spiritual merit I'm gaining by, 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 by giving this donation or donating this particular architectural element or a sculpture or a cave, the benefit may be shared by all living things. And like this indicates the, the, the transitional phase from early Buddhism to early Mahayana. Because the, the gradually focus is shifting from, uh, you know, Buddha to Bodhisattva. As, as we know that in, uh, in early Mahayana literature, Bodhisattva is portrayed as a boatman. You know, like who can cross the Bhavasagar anytime, but he is not doing that because he is helping out the other, uh, you know, jivas to cross the Bhavasagar in his own uh, ship. You know, so he, he is a boatman who is helping out everybody else. And this kind of uh, imagery gets like, uh, can be seen in these inscriptions where Acharyas are stating that let all other living beings become Buddha by sharing my spiritual merit of uh, this donation. And this is something which is very significantly coming from the sites like Kaneri, uh, you can say Nasik for that example, which actually mark the, the transition. So when we talk about the mature phase of Kaneri, Though we say, though we call it as early Theravada or Theravada tradition, it is primarily the transition from Theravada to early Mahayana. There is another category of donors and that is from the laity and laity category is divided into two parts. One is of the kings and the royal men or nobles. So there are three category of people we see. There is a donation of one Mahabhoja. There is a donation of Bhujiki, that is the wife of Bhuja, Bhujaka. And then there are two donations of two different kings from the early period. What we see here is, there is one donation of a princess, uh, where the, the name of who the, the princess is lost because, uh, because, the, because of the damage uh, which is there to the inscription due to, due to natural forces. But this princess was a wife of a Satavana king and, and the daughter of a, a Kshatrapa king Rudra. You know, so that also talks about the matrimonial alliance in the early period and that inscription talks and this, this, this princess has given donation of a, a water system in chair number, uh, you can say five at Kanye. The third category or rather the 2B category is, is the major category where most of the donors coming from, they, they have been identified as, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, individual donors. So there are merchants, Upasaka. Then there are group of merchants like Negama. Then uh, there are professionals like goldsmith, blacksmith, Manikara, uh, then polisher, then Vaidya, then Sethi, uh, ministers. Then there are housewives and there are there are there are around 23 donors who have not given any identity identity except their name uh, in the donation or some of the inscriptions primarily do not talk about donors they just it's a one line uh, kind of inscription talking about what the donation is or you know so this is the largest category and these people were responsible for creation of so there are around 100 odd inscriptions which we have coming from Kaneri talking about shedding some light on the life of these people, identity of these people. And the most important is uh, about, about the relation between monastery and donors in the early period. So I'm, I'm today going to restrict myself to the, to the Satavana period because uh, you know we have a different story to narrate in the Traikutaka and uh, uh, Shilahara and then the medieval period. You know, so due to time constraints, we'll just be talking about first two to four hundred years at Kaneri. So Satavana and some part of the post-Satavana developments at uh, Kaneri. From where this money was coming, where was uh, the source of, uh, of money, and how how these hundred and twenty-nine caves within you can say second third century AD have been excavated. So. Actually, it's, it's, it's not more than 150 years, we see. So within, within 150 years, we are around 75 to 80 caves of being excavated at that. It needs huge money, you know, and this huge amount of money has been poured at Kaneri by, by donors. This, this patronage has proved as one of the very significant uh, factor in the flourishment of Kaneri. From where this amount, this money used to come, like that's that how, how these traders were so rich, from where the prosperity has come to Canada. And for that, we need to understand some data coming from cave number three and cave number 87 at Canary. So Canary is on an island, as I said. The, the donor uh, of cave number three uh, is from Kalyana. Then the sculptures, which have been identified by various scholars as donor couples, the sculptures of the donor couples, uh, which uh, stylistically basically show us the influence coming from the Kshatrapa art. Then there are inscriptions, there are two inscriptions, paleographically they show the, the influence coming from Kshatrapa inscriptions. Then we have this image of Buddha. The standing image of Buddha is in the Mathura school of art, Mathura style, uh, Kushana period. So a second century ago, this is a copy of a metal image uh, in the stone at Kandhi. Then uh, in cave number 87, we have found the copper plate, uh, which makes mention to the reign of Trikutakas. And uh, uh, obviously dating back to fifth century AD. And, uh, this talks about the native place of the donor being yeah, in the Sindha mission. So this is somewhere here. Uh, the, the arrow is wrongly placed, but it's somewhere here. And then we have this man with a conical cap, which is kind of a Scythian cap, which we see. And then we have the depiction of double M camel coming from uh, Bactria. And beyond that, we have the depiction of griffins at Kaneri. Uh, the photograph of, like taking photograph is really difficult because that is in a very dark uh, area in cave number three. So that link us with Persian, uh, you know, mythology. So what we are actually looking at is, this is a trade route reflected in art and inscriptions at Kaneri in second, third century AD. This trade route links the Western Indian ports with the Silk Roads. So this was probably the like offshoot of Silk Roads reaching down to Western coast from where the sea route was taken uh, to reach to Roman Empire. And this is how 
this entire uh, site has enjoyed the prosperity uh, coming down from the sea tours. There are places which are mentioned uh, in inscriptions. So that gives us some fair idea about uh, various uh, geographic locations and the catchment uh, with which Kaneri was associated. So there are nearby places like Ambili, Chaul, Kalya, and Magadme. The distance, far distant places like Paitan, uh, Nasik, which have been mentioned. And then, then we actually see the art, the archaeological evidence talking about this. So here's a general map uh, which, which I have shown there uh, about uh, like these places mentioned over here. So this is the city of Bombay or city of Mumbai. And on this island, we have Kanheri. Oh, I'm sorry, this is yeah. On this on this island, uh, we have city of Kane, uh, site of Kanheri. So this is to just give us the general understanding of how the silk roads and uh, how these places were linked. So what, what was the actual catchment of Kanheri? So the core area, the core catchment of Kanheri comprised of various uh, cities like Sopara Kalyan Thane, Elephanta, because see, this is an island, this is the Vasil Creek, and uh, it, it, this entire creek isolates this landmass from the mainland. And this ultimately de develops into a Thana Creek, and you have Elephanta over here. So, Elephanta, Thane, Kalyan, Sopara were the major sites, urban sites. And there are two uh, villages which are mentioned in the inscription Safale and Magatne, which have been producing surplus. Uh, to support this uh, urban centers. You know, like urban centers are primarily non food producing centers uh, surviving on the surplus produced by villages. As we all understand. Apart from that, we have references uh, in inscriptions and literature which is associated with Kanheri. One is of the Sindha Vishal, which we have already talked about. Then Dhanikota, Paitan Nasi, Gaudadesha, that is the, the present day Bangladesh and Bengal. And then there is one 11th century manuscript coming from Nepal, which actually gives us miniature paintings of the site of Kanesh. And there, 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 is an, there, is, there, there is an identification of Kaneri in the painting based on the titles, which is like it is mentioned there, like this is Kaneri Mahavya. So these are the caves which we see, uh, which were excavated in first 150 years. And again, you see, this is a large number of, it's a huge number of caves. Apart from that, what we have is, these are the letter caves added to the site, and then which gives you the overall understanding of 129 caves at Kanye. Now, chronologically, if you are to see the early phase or the formative phase begins somewhere in the first century BC, continues up to first century CE. The mature phase begins uh, in second century AD, continues up to 10th century. And the overlapping mature, uh, the, the decline or late phase, which somewhere begins in 10th, 11th century, and continues up to 15th century. So we have early caves like this, then the cave number 11, which is of the Trikutaka period, and then this early chaos is being modified in the Shilahara period by, by introducing this image of Akshobhya at the site. So it is, it is not so that early chaos were not used in the later period. It was a combination of early and later chaos which formed the entire site. When we look at the chronological development at site and the early patronage, this is the pattern, this is the chronology. Uh, what we see of, of early caves. So somewhere it begins, the, the, the classical phase somewhere begins around 125 C and continues up to 250 C. This is the early cave which I was talking about. Uh, So this is a natural, uh, you can say, depression, and then th th there is a staircase uh, which links us to this particular cave. And then, if you observe, there is a stupa which is carved here. 
So this is a better photograph of the stupa. We had to take a drone photograph uh, with help of drone power excavating this. So this is that stupa which uh, uh, this is that stupa which I was talking about. And this is the stupa from Konda, which, which is for a comparison. I have shown you and that early patronage has created this at at Kaneri in the in the first hundred and fifty years. So this is the mature phase chronology where we have hardly any caves excavated in uh, around seventy five years. Dating back to 450 CE to 525 CE. Now, if you observe this, this is uh, the, the actually clear photo, uh, which, which gives us a better understanding where the, the Chinese monk traveler Yuan Sang states that the caves are excavated in three phases. So, three layers. So, this is one layer of cave, this is another layer, and this is the third layer of cave. But going beyond that, what you observe here is the caves have also evolved in some groups and clusters. For example, you have this group of caves, then you have this group of caves, then you have this group of caves, then you have this group of caves, which is different than this group of caves. So, on the basis of their chronology, their uh, location, one can actually divide this entire site into small groups. And rather this chronological brackets have been given in that sense. You know, so, so when we say phase one caves, this is how the chronology is seen. And like there are certain uh, later caves which are intermingled in the early cave and they form an exclusive unique landscape in the region. So these are the, you can say, uh, caves which uh, belong to early caves and like modified over the period of time and uh, you know mark their exclusive identity with the help of veterans. So when we look at these caves, as I said, they are divided into smaller groups. Basically, like on the basis of location, you realize that they, they are scattered on different groups. So these groups uh, which we were talking about uh, it is, is, is a quite interesting development at Kamiri because see there are certain caves which were excavated at the low counter near low country near the source of water. But in the early period those spaces were left empty, left open and then some caves in the higher country for example cave number 56 belong to this particular group and dated to late like last quarter of second century AD. So we know that at that time this cave number 11 was not there and there was a space to excavate caves but these people chose to, the present location of cave number 52, 57 with, a, with, a purpose, with a purpose. It was not an accidental choice. You know, so uh, these groups have evolved and that is probably on the insistence of uh, insistence from uh, you can say the patrons at Kali. So uh, this is uh, like I just wanted to talk about the clusters of cave, which you can actually see. This is one cluster, then this is another cluster, and then this belongs to some other cluster of caves. So primarily they have come together. So, uh, in a group to maintain their exclusive identity. So, this is a better picture which gives you a better understanding where you have this group isolated from this, then this group isolated from this and this. So, those though, like, though these groups were connected to each other with the help of uh, staircases, they were exclusively created uh, a maintaining distance from each other. Epigraphical source suggests us that uh, uh, there were different Nikayas and in one of my papers I have showed the association between groups and Nikayas. So, we have Bhadrayani, Aparashalya and there is unknown sect which is either 
Sarvasti Vadin or which is uh, either Mahasangika sect, which uh, prevailed here in the early 200 years. Now, these are the groups which are associated with different Nikayas. And it is interesting to see that each of these Nikayas, they have a sphere of influ influence within the catchment of Kanel. For example, the donors from the red group, most of them either come from Kalyan or, or from Sopara. So they come from very nearby, close by places and uh, belonging to urban area, which was a major catchment. And probably these were the Nikayas, which were very prosperous. They have fetched good amount of money in the early century, like early period, and gradually handed over uh, the entire resource to the uh, Sarvastivad or Mahasangiva sect, which is the unknown sect. Uh, because there is no inscription to confirm what sect it was. So, probably this Badra area has got merged into the other sect uh, gradually, which is what I call is that unknown, but probably that is Mahasangiva or Sarvastivad. The, the group E, which is of the upper Ashelia, which makes mention of the Dharnikota in, in, in cave number 65, and which is again a far distance uh, site. We know Upper Ashelia, Pupa Shailia, they have their special connections with Nagarjun, Gonda, Amravati, Dharnikota, and so on and so forth. So the third group, which is not, nowhere mentioned in epigraphical data is called, like is, is, is being named here as unknown sect or unknown group. So there are four such groups. And what we see is, uh, there is hardly any epigraphical data available to us, other than uh, some of the names of the donors. And there is one fragmented inscription in cave number 16, which talks about uh, uh, the, the establishment of this monastic settlement and uh, also the nativity or the native place of the donor uh, being Sopara. So probably the monastery of Sopara had various types of Nikayas living together, grabbing natural and human, human resources and diverting the entire outcome to the, to the the, the surplus to the Kane. And this is this is the ideal model which we which we see. So these are some of the glimpses of early caves, uh, cave number 57, probably used by uh, uh, uh or Sarvasti Nikaya. So these are some of the photographs I will show because see uh, when we talk about benches, we usually talk about uh, what was probably the use of these benches. Many scholars suggest that either those were used for meditation or for the sleeping purpose. Definitely those can be used for meditation, but I'm really doubtful about why should they use these benches for sleeping because those are not at all handy and probably molecular or rather the most of the times members of the society look after or take care of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, monastic settlements and monks. So uh, they had enough infrastructure made in wood. So even today, if you see uh, Thai monasteries or Tibetan monasteries, there are hardly any uh, benches made in uh, permanent material like this, uh, which which they have in the monastery. They have wooden wooden uh, uh, you can say uh, beds or they have proper carpets made for monks because it's, that is easy to look after. That is easy to maintain, you know? So it is very difficult to maintain this kind of permanent structure. So what I suggest is probably this is associated with a set of rituals, set of religious practices coming, uh, like linking Buddhism with laity. You know, so this link between late and Buddhism is early Mayana, which I'm talking about. 
and that is basically the involvement of laity as a patron at the site see buddhism primarily denies the uh, independent existence of of an object emphasizing the renunciation of the world so at one point of time the message given to laity was kind of you know uh, uh you are not going to achieve anything anyways in the spiritual world this in this world because you are a householder but what you have to uh, do is you have to keep giving donations because in some day or some birth some next birth or something in the cycle of rebirth you will achieve that spiritual status after renouncement and to reach to that place you you have to uh, give donation so donations came in as as a as as a ritual practice religious practice to gain spiritual merit uh and probably these kind of architectural changes which we see at kaneri uh it is an outcome of that practice because you see these are this there, there are remains of plasters and then uh, there was a wooden like provision here made like provision made here to place a curtain in front of that so probably there were religious paintings and this entire space was a ritual space instead of the place made for sleeping or something like that another important observation which we have made is these rooms where we have these kinds of bench in l shape or a specific a uh, type of benches which we see in this cave those rooms had a provision to lock those rooms from inside you know so if if that is so then like if if those places were made for as as a, as a residential cave then then why why a particular room has a door and a lock door and a bolt you know so probably it was for the ritual objects to place them at one particular place to maintain them to protect them donors have probably come up with these kinds of ideas which they use in their material world this also can see in in in, in the parallel jain like present jain traditions and buddhist traditions i will not go into the details of this but probably this has resulted into early image worship so what we see is people are coming from uh, mathura coming from chatrapur region coming from kushana region with these new ideas who were traveling on the on the on the trade routes so these traders along with monks and artisans traveling together carrying ideas concepts uh you know like uh, it, it it is kind kind it is a kind of conferences of uh, you can say uh, ideas and religions what we see on the trade routes so probably what we see in the early period mathura was uh, was the core for sarvastivadins or kashmir was a core for sarvastivadins in the in the in the kushana period and travelers traveling on trade routes from these places to kaneri has brought these wonderful ideas and one of that idea was the image worship which we see in the satavahana period as as i have already shown you the mathura style image of buddha which comes from cave number 3 at kaneri and this is not an exceptional case where we have this early image of buddha coming from second century ad from kaneri because there were six such images at kaneri we know about and beyond that uh, there were numerous movable image pro images probably installed there those were associated with the kaneri rituals and kaneri rituals play a vital role in the daily life of laity it hardly matters for monks how how the kaneri rituals uh, or you know uh, like uh what well, like worldly rituals like rituals uh, which are to be performed to gain some worldly merits those kinds of rituals they hardly matter in the life of a monk but they play a vital role a guiding force in 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 the life of uh, a laity the classic example in the living tradition if i had to state here is buddha is being worshiped as a fertility god in bhutan as well as in sri lanka 
So these are the two different traditions in Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana, where Buddha is being worshipped as a fertility god. So after harvest, the first crop, the palik, some part of it is offered to the Lord Buddha as kind of thanksgiving in Sri Lanka. And there is a ritual associated with that. So that living tradition also tells us that these kinds of rituals, they play a vital role in the life of laity because that is their life. It hardly matters for laity if, if, if uh, he or she achieves nirvana or not. It is a long-term goal kind of thing. But what matters is short-term objective. You know? And that is expressed through image worship. So donors have probably carried these concepts to Kaneri and Kaneri has uh, fulfilled their needs, catered their needs, because of which they poured a lot of money at Kaneri and you have virtually see around 75% of caves at Kaneri being excavated in 120 to 150 years. So this is the image I was talking about, the, the Mathura style image of uh, Kushana period. And this is the just on the opposite side of the pillar in the same courtyard of cave number three. This is the provision where the metal image was installed. So if you stylistically study this image, this is a copy of a metal image, which was placed here. Probably when the site was abandoned, this metal image was taken away by, by the monks at Kaneri. Now, when we look at the entire development around Kaneri, it has emerged with the satellite satellites. Now, in the mature phase, Kaneri is developing as a, as a nucleus of a religious landscape which is being supported by numerous other sites. And you can actually see sites are being uh, coming under the influence of Kaneri one after the other. For example, the case of Padan. Padan is a lost site in Mumbai uh, in the expansion of uh, rather the West, when the Western Express Highway was created, half of the site was destroyed unknowingly, like it was in the British period. The first road, which was was a Western Express Highway, that the site was located near Kandivli, uh, like between Kandivli and Mala, today known as Bandungri, where we have Times of India uh, place located, or Sports Authority of India campus located on. So this Padan Hill gives us the references to various ascetic traditions. In the early period, uh, there are around uh, thirteen inscriptions which we have found on that particular hill which were reported by Pandit Bhagwan Lal Indraji, and he talks about it. So uh, in, in second, third century AD, you, you get to see these early inscriptions with the names of various ascetic traditions. And then there is a reference of Rama Ikama, that is the footprint of Rama. Uh, and then uh, uh, you know, Siddha Musala kind of uh, names are there. So this was basically the Dera or, or the location or a place which was occupied by ascetic traditions. Gradually, by 5th century AD, what you see is the Buddhist inscriptions coming up. Like Ye Dharma, Etu Prabhava, Tathagata. That's the standard formula which you see uh, it's still, like getting engraved. So you actually see how the site is being uh, con getting converted, coming under the influence of Buddhism, influence of Kaneri. And obviously, the, the resources which are being grabbed uh, by the site. You know, so when we look at Kaneri, Kaneri works as a nucleus. So Kaneri has its own limitation for the exploiting resources, uh, including the human resource, which we call uh, petrolnet. You know, but when Kaneri comes up with these satellite settlements, because we know from art historical data, epigraphical data, um, that Kaneri was a nucleus and had uh, some connection with Mahakali in the south, Magatne and Padan in the west, Jivdani in the north, and Sopara as we have already discussed, and Lonad in the, in the east. So this is the range from 2nd to 5th century caves around Kaneri, and they have, they have flourished as satellite settlements of Kaneri. So you can actually see inscriptions talking about Ambivale, which is near Lonad. No, uh, inscriptions talking donors, major donors coming from Sopara, which is near Jivdani. You know, 
So Kalyan Ambuli is, is actually not far from Lunan that we know, or rather Elephanta, where we have uh, the early stupa. You know, so so Kaneri serves as a nucleus of this religious landscape, which is surrounded by these Buddhist sites, which gradually were challenged by, uh, you can say, the, the Shaiva Pashupata tradition. They started sharing the resources. But the region was such rich in, uh, you can say, uh, resources because of the proximity of the region to these important commercial centers like Sopara, Kalyan, Thani, Chaul, Elephanta, Khan, then uh, like Bhodbandar and other, uh, like all other uh, places which you see here, they, they play a vital role in the development of uh, this entire landscape. They, they have contributed in sense of prosperity, surplus, which is being shared and exploited, exploited again and again by, by all these uh, Buddhist and Shaiva monastic uh, sites. When Kaneri was operating as a nucleus of this religious landscape through these satellite settlements, Kaneri had expanded its scope of, uh, you can say, uh, uh, holding the resources and the country. And two of those resources, important uh, villages, which we know from second century AD inscription, is from Safale and Magatne. Uh, today, even at Magadne, uh, like they talk about uh, that the inscription in chapter number 21 talks about the Adapana Kheta at uh, Magadne. Adapana Kheta is basically the owner uh, of the agricultural land from Magadne, comes from Kalyan, and he had given land to the local people uh, to cultivate. And the deal between the, the owner and uh, the the, the agricultural labor was kind of uh, the, the division of 50% profit. So the inscription says the, the owner of the land who is Aparenu coming from Kalyan has given his share in donation to Kaneri. So land is being exploited as a, as a resource by human resource who is not directly linked with Kaneri but the owner of the land is from Kalyan is giving this donation to Kaneri. So the profit is being shared with Kaneri of this kind of agricultural land. So this gives us some glimpses of the Satavana period, how the land holdings were being exploited by the monastery. So it was not monks who were doing that. Obviously they are in all the world, but the lady was directly involved and that is how the patronage uh, works. So this, diagram gives us some idea about the, the, the resource sharing. So green indicates uh, Buddhist sites and uh, yellow indicates uh, uh, Shaiva sites. And then they flourished uh, for, for around 1000 years together with the surplus produced at the site. And then these, these monastic settlements came up. Uh, gradually, the decline began in the uh, 10th century AD. And like, why, why I'm showing this slide is this is Kyo number 87. We have uh, 64 stupas uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular cave made in bricks in a memory, uh, constructed in memory of various acharyas who have stayed at Kaneri, who have taught in the monastic settlement. So this is the first stupa gallery which we have at Kaneri. This is the second stupa gallery, like the full of cactuses which you see. It's, it's actually the archaeological site where we, we have the foundations of brick stupa and the third stupa gallery which we uh, which was reported is from this particular area. This is uh, number 31, 32, uh, sorry, 31, 32, 33 and then Kyo number 25 over here. So uh, the, the, the systematic excavation and the clearance was done at, at this particular uh, area in 1839 and then 1951, you know. So we know that these were the three stupa galleries where the memorial stupas of various acharyas. So the number goes beyond 100. You know? So that gives us an understanding of how these monasteries were functioning, how these elite people were living here, how academicians or the monks who were contributing 
in a very practical way spiritual way to the life of daily life of patrons and contributing to uh, the the betterment of their life so this was kind of a dialogue between monastery and uh, laity it 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 was not just the one way give like it, it was a give and take which we which we uh, observe at, at kanadi obviously in 6th century and in 10th century and in 15th century we have different pattern of patronage this is what i was trying to give you as glimpses from the early period the early development at kanadi which gradually got expanded to this catchment of kanadi and uh, continued up to 15th century ad so i thank all who have helped me in preparing this presentation basically by giving this uh, photographs uh, and i thank organizers and all participants for uh, patient listening uh, thank you thank you uh, dr suraj i mean it it, it was a wonderful talk uh, and many facets of uh, the patronage uh, uh, of the kanheri uh, caves was described by you it's really fascinating and mind boggling also to a certain extent uh, because in those early days how they had a uh, uh, kind of maintained uh, uh, maybe long distant uh, network also influences from other regions and also the intricate uh, I mean, towards the end you told about the intricate uh, uh relations between the different uh, monastic settlements uh, in and around the uh, mumbai region so it's, it's really interesting to know i mean so i i now request uh, sharda to moderate the uh, q&a session uh, we can take up the questions from the q&a and i request all the participants to type their uh, questions in the q&a chat box yes so right now i see uh, five questions and begin with the first one which is by dr ravi s gupta who asks um, nalanda mahavihara was donated number of villages for upkeep of the mahavihara by different contemporary kings like harshavardhan and devpal and according to huen sang and it sing 200 and 100 villages were donated by the ruler uh, so what was the difference between the nalanda mahavihara and Uh, the krishna giri uh, regarding its uh, their patronage uh, i think uh, if if we see the difference is 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 mainly because uh, like uh, in, in mainly sense of uh, the resources which we have you know like kanari surrounded by major port cities and commercial center and nalanda is uh, is exclusively developed as a, as a mahavihara site as we as we understand so uh, kanari uh, survived on the surplus of uh, commercial centers port centers which were exposed directly to the outer world so the so the quantity of surplus which probably enjoyed by kanari from the uh, you can say so lesser data or lesser resources was much more you know because like when you have sopara kalyan elephanta and chaul these four major commercial centers which have been discussed by virtually all all traders coming from roman and arab like arabic and whatever regions like arabia regions uh, over the period of 15 1600 years they keep talking about the prosperity nalanda is uh, not like that you know like nalanda has major major chunk of royal patronage nalanda has a yes laity is there i'm not saying laity is not there but the profile of laity which you see at kanheri is totally different than uh uh you know uh, nalanda usually i say that mumbai is mumbai because mumbai has been ruled by traders for last 2300 years you know and that is that is what makes kanheri different than every other site in 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 world okay um so the next question is by um from the pama research institute by uh, dr pj cherian he asks who managed the donations is critical because even if the denominations were 
meant for digging caves, it involves a lot of social engineering. Which social group did that management? Uh, I agree, sir. This is uh, this is a very critical issue, and we need to talk about it. But uh, what what I understand from the existing parallels of the monastic settlements uh, in Buddhist traditions, like in Sri Lanka or in Japan, or you see in uh, China, like when China was a Buddhist country few decades, uh, like before the Cultural Revolution, or in Tibet, Tibetan tradition rather. In the, in the tradition of Dalai Lama, what we see is the resource management was done by laity under the guidance of uh, Acharyas. So even today in Jain monasticism, what we see is uh, Jain Munis are hold over the monastery, but monastery is managed and resources is, are managed by a committee uh, uh, which, is, which is of laity. You know, so monks are not directly involved in the day-to-day -day administration as well, but nothing happens without their, uh, you know, uh, consent. So I think that is how these uh, properties were being handled. Otherwise, it was very difficult. Uh, like, like when we see the later data coming from Shilahara period, we actually have agricultural lands around Ganeri, which are being maintained because there is one... Uh, uh, Askers Tele we have found within National Park indicating a donation of agricultural land. So within the periphery of National Park, it's hardly two kilometers away from Kaneri, which we have found in our survey, in our explorations. And uh, then that is virtually being maintained by uh, monastery. That comes under the agricultural land, comes under monastery. You know, because there is no village around or there was no settlement around known to us. Probably it is our ignorance or lack of data which is available to us. But uh, what I understand is by 10th century AD, when we look at this, monastery has turned in this, uh, you can say the management skills with the help of ladies. And the, and the roots of this goes back to Satavana period. Because monks directly uh, do not handle any property. That is what I understand. I hope, uh, like this is, I'm trying to explain. I don't know. Uh, uh, I might be wrong. I stand corrected. Wherever. So he he does congratulate you and thanks you for an excellent talk with such great empirical data. And he has uh, a little more to comment on this. Thank so you. I'm reading out what he has written. Don't you think that we have to look at the Indian culture during the early historic period on the Western coast on the basis of the Western or Semitic binaries of spiritual versus uh, uh, spiritual versus material, uh, which will be a problem. I'm also asking this question as um, I'm also asking this question at Patanam because I see the absence of such binaries. So the provision of a locked room was part of their spiritual urges, and this is different from the treasury managed by the king in Europe since it was material wealth. So, do you have any comments on that? Basically, in our three-day site seminars, we go cave by cave, pillar by pillar, and wall by wall. You know, uh, what we try to understand is why a particular element, if it is there, is there, and if it is not there, is not there. And this is a very, what, what I can say, empirical way to understand uh, uh, the, the issue. But yes, uh, thanks to uh, MMRDA, Mumbai Metropolitan Region Development Authority, uh, they have a heritage conservation cell society, uh, their own committee, uh, who have uh, sanctioned a project for us, which resulted into a publication of a profitable book last year, where we have actually talked about uh, the, the cultural data uh, coming from this region. Because there are uh, more than what we can say, 26 archaeological sites, what we have identified in uh, Mumbai metropolitan region, and uh, which covers this entire catchment of Kaneri. You know, and that gives us some glimpses. For example, yes, like uh, I understand Patanam gives us amazing kind of data. We definitely uh, is not available with us right now, but the quantity of inscriptions which we have. And another thing is, uh, like I had given a lecture last year at Asiatic Society of Mumbai, where I talked about literary sources of Mumbai metropolitan region. 
so i have picked up sources which gives us minimum one page description of any site uh, in the region of mumbai and i could uh, i could identify 63 prakrut pali and uh, sanskrit texts talking about mumbai from uh, pali canonical literature to 12th 13th century ad so i could not go beyond that because you know uh, uh, because of my limitations i i i do not understand arabic and persian and everything but 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 what i understand is uh, taranatha's uh, history of indian buddhism gives references to nanari you know there are there is one diary of a monk 20th century monk which we uh, i could get from uh, nara archives which talks about kaneri uh, like who who lived somewhere in the first quarter of 20th century who talks about kaneri uh, as how the kaneri was being remembered in the oral tradition of his own monastery you know so i think these references give us some glimpses of the cultural life because ultimately uh, what we do as an archaeologist like we try to um, like travel from material to abstract world you know and that is our job and like i think these are the glimpses which help us to reconstruct that cultural life uh, again i know these are this is uh, uh, very scanty evidence i i accept uh, the the problem but we need to move ahead thank you so the next uh, there are two questions by the same participant prathamesh the first one he asks is do kanheri and mandar caves have they, do they share any connection yes they do uh, they do they and do. this i'll just read out the second question yeah, maybe yeah. it'll uh, you can connect the two so he says please shed uh, light if kanheri was still inhabited by buddhist monks when the portuguese first arrived in mumbai there is one stray reference about the second thing where uh, where the land the, the property of kanheri is been confiscated by portuguese uh, is mentioned and like they have shoot off the the ascetics living there but we do not know they were buddhist or uh, 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 some some other ascetics but in uh, cave number 33 when the excavations were uh, conducted in uh, 19th century uh, when digging was done rather it was not systematic excavation uh, it was in 1839 to 41 somewhere in some of the stupas we have found bahmani coins and uh, gujarat sultan coins buried along with uh, ashes in the casket kind of so it indicates that site was functioning at least in the bahmani and gujarat uh, sultan period otherwise why would stupas were could be constructed uh, with these coins and etc you know so there is a possibility uh, when portuguese arrived here uh, we we published this paper in numismatic articles like my paper with dr manish kalra on these coins and the the, the last evidence coming from that about kaneri and mandar definitely when we study the architectural patterns and like we 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 see the parallels in inscriptions you can actually draw par- draw parallels in cultural uh, you know behavior of these two sites so there is a close uh, connection okay um so mr t s subramanyam he asks why haven't the kaneri caves got the attention they deserve say when compared to ajanta and elora see ajanta and elora they are uh, visually impressive when you when you just visit ajanta and elora you just visit ajanta you just can't think about anything else and that is what you see mesmerizing on the right support you know ferguson is totally lost when when he writes about ajanta and elora but the description which he, which he has given of kaner is very dry <laughs> you know because like like what what we do in in canary side seminar we 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 try to teach people how to visualize you know the lost material see when, when there is a lot of plaster available when there are descriptions of the paintings available how do you visualize it when you have a data coming from ajanta and elora visualize it at canary and then interpret it you know that is 
that is our our job you know like that is our our profession uh, we cannot expect anybody and uh, everybody to do that it, it's a part of our training you know and that's why probably kanari remain neglected uh, for for quite a long time so uh, he says uh, in re- in reply to your explanation that thanks for the informative lecture kanari invites me now yes you are welcome to my second a uh, visit is due yes so the next question is by uh, prathamesh um so he says also in modern times buddhism is seen as an alternative to the brahmanical traditions hence can we say that back in their times were complexes like kanheri inclusive and had monks belonging to various castes i think uh, we have to understand our ancestors with their own understanding of their life we cannot just understand their life with our understanding of the modern parameters you know their ethics were different their i'm not saying those, those are right wrong or acceptable or not those are second century ad ethics and these are 21st century ad ethics so i think uh, you know uh, when we when we talk about alternative accommodative uh, these are we are judging our ancestors with our uh, so we are we, we are getting too judgmental about it the question about brahmanical and buddhist traditions being parallel or alternative i'll just say when sarvadarshan sangraha was written or was composed by ramanujacharya there is a chapter on buddhism so uh, their approach towards understanding this religious tradition was rather more inclusive than what we have today uh, that is what i would say in for like I, i'm just talking about ramanuja jare if i go back uh, still like there is a reference in kuda inscription where a brahman is giving donation for of the chaitya you know there is one uh, inscription coming from junnar where the wife wife of a brahman giving donation of a vihara kind of you know literature gives us references where jain buddhist and hindu staying together as a family member in one family coming from early period satavahana period you know gatha satya sethi gives us a totally different understanding of the entire cultural landscape uh, of satavahana period you know i think we need to uh, understand our ancestors from their own parameter and not our uh, parameters that is what i suggest here i again stand corrected if you feel i'm wrong so the next question is by uh shikha who asks uh, sir have you come across any uh name of the cave diggers or maybe groups a uh, group of artisans or their community who were involved in the inscription or does any literature talk about them because still in maharashtra gujarat and madhya pradesh the gajthars do such uh, work like pond digging or stone digging work uh their community connects their lineage with the sagar putras who dug the earth yes shikha uh cave number 3 inscription gives us a community name as shelo vadhati so the entire process of excavation of cave as the, the glimpses can be get from this inscription cave number 3 inscription at kaneri where they say that shela vadakis were the people who so shela vadaki shela is shaila vadaki is vardaki so the carpenters carpenters working in stone have contributed towards the excavation of caves and they were the outsourced like they were the contractors who were the given the work outsourced the work by the monastery that is what we know because we know the names of the supervisors supervisor of monks uh, who have supervised the entire uh, uh, construction activity at the site and again this is not the exclusive one evidence which we are talking about because such references we get from anuradhapur inscriptions coming from sri lanka you know where the names of the supervisors are, are mentioned the last one is not a question but rather a very um very nice comment because it kind of you know summarizes this whole thing that he says this is by dr aman kumar singh he says that the same uh, people or perhaps the same kind of contribution of patronage is required in the modern days for the conservation and preservation of the kanheri site uh, as it received in the past so i think we are done with almost all the questions a couple of participants have thanked you for this wonderful lecture
Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suraj, for this wonderful talk and also uh, answering the questions uh, at the end. I thank you for delivering this talk and also thank all the participants who have uh, attended this talk. And uh, uh, through this talk, we have completed two years, as I told earlier, and we are continuing our journey. Again, we are going to initiate a series of themes from next lecture onwards. Hopefully, we will be covering more on uh, art sciences in archaeology and also other aspects of uh, archaeology, like maybe epigraphy and numismatics. Thanks a lot for your patronage and thank you once again for each and every. Thank you.